Section 1 of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Rocket of Iron of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. It was one of those misty October nightfalls of the north when the white fog creeps up from the river and winds itself like a corpse sheet around the black ant-like mass of human insignificance a cold menace from nature to man till the foreboding of that irresistible fatality which will one day lay us all beneath the eyes death sits upon your breast and stifles you till you start up desperately crying let me out let me out for an hour i had been staring through the window at the chill steam thickening and blurring out the lines that zigzag through it indefinitely pale drunken images of facts staggering against the invulnerable vapour that walled me in in a sublimated grave marble were they all ghost those figures wandering across the white night hardly distinguishable from the post and pickets that wove in and out like half dismembered bodies writhing in pain my own fingers were curiously numb and inert had i too become a shadow it grew unbearable at last the pressure of the foreboding at my heart the sense of that uncreeping of universal death i ran out of doors impelled by the vague impulse to assert my own being to seek relief in struggle even though foredoomed futile to seek warmth a fellowship somewhere though but with those ineffective palers in the mist that dissolved even while i looked at them once in the street i ran on indifferently glad to be jostled glad of the snarling of dogs and the curses of laborers calling to one another the penumbra of the mist that menacing dim foreshadow had not chilled this van on on through the alleys where human flesh was closed and when one listened one could hear breathings and many feet drifting at last into the current that swept the main channel of the city and presently we were round in an eddy i found myself staring through the open door of the great iron works perhaps it was the sensation of warmth that held me there first some feeling of exhilaration and wakening defiance in the flash and swirl of the yellow flames this mixed with an indistinct desire to clutch at something anything that seemed stationary in the midst of all this that slipped and wavered and fell away no i remember now there was something before that there was a sound a sound that had stopped my feet in their going and smote me with a long shudder a sound of hammers beating 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 a terrific hail momentarily fast and louder and in between a panting as of some great monster catching breath beneath the driving of that iron rain faster faster clang a long reverberant shriek the giant had roared and shivered in his pain involuntarily i was drawn down into the valley of the sound words muttering themselves through my lips as i passed forging forging what are we forging there frankenstein makes his monster how the iron screams but i heard it no more now i only saw saw the curling yellow flames and the red red iron that panted and the masters of the hammers how they move there like demons in the abyss their bodies swinging their eyes tense and a glitter their faces covered with the gloom of a torture chamber only one face i saw young and fair young and very fair whereon the gloom seemed not to settle the skin of it was white and shining there in the midst of that black haze though the white forehead fell tumbling waves of thick brown hair and two great dark eyes looked steadily into the red iron as if they saw therein something i did not see only now and then they were lifted and looked away upward as if beyond the smoke pall they beheld a vision once he turned so that the rose light cast forth his profile as a silhouette and i shivered it was so fine and hard hard with the hardness of beaten iron and fine with the fineness of a keen chisel had the hammers been beating on that fair young face a comrade called a sudden terrified cry there was a wild rush a mad stampede of feet a horrible screech of hissing metal and a rocket of iron shot upward toward the black roof bursting and falling in a burning shower three figures lay writhing along the floor among the leaping demoniac sparks the first to leave them was a man with a white face he had stood still in the storm and ran forward when the others shrank back now he passed by me bearing his dying burden and i saw no quiver upon brow or chin only when he laid it in the ambulance i fancied i saw upon the delicate curved lips a line of purpose deepen and the reflection of the iron fire glow in the strange eyes as if for an instant the door of a hidden furnace had been open and smouldering coals had breathed the air and even then he looked up it was all over in half an hour there would be weeping in three little homes 
and one was dead, and one would die, and one would crawl, a seared human stump to the end of his weary days. The crowd that had gathered was gone. They would not know the stump when it begged from them with its maimed hands. Six months after, on some street corner, Fakir they would say, and laugh. There would be an entry on the company's books, and a brief line in the newspapers next day. But the welding of the iron would go on, and the man who gave his easy money for it would fancy he had paid for it, not seeing the stiff figures in their graves, nor the crippled beggar, nor the broken homes. The rocket of iron is already cold, dull, inert, fireless. The black fragments lie upon the floor whereon they lately rain their red revenge. Do with them what you will. You cannot undo their work. The men are clearing away. Only he with a white face does not go back to his place. Still set and silent, he takes his coat, presses his soft hat down upon his thick damp locks, and goes out into the fog and night. So close he passed me. I might have touched him, but he never saw me. Perhaps he was still carrying the burden of a dying man upon his heart. Perhaps some mightier burden. For one instant, the shapely boyish figure was in full light. Then it vanished away in the engulfing mist, the mist which the vision of him had made me forget. For I knew I had seen a man of iron, into whose soul the iron had driven, whose nerves were tempered as cold steel, but behind whose still impassive figures slumbered a white-hot heart and others should see a rocket and a ruin and feel the vengeance of beaten iron before the mist comes and swallows all i had forgotten upon that face that young fair face so smooth and fine that even the black smoke would not rest upon it there bloomed the roses of early death hot house flowers and of a rocket of iron Section 2 of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches, and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chain Gang of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches, and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. It is far, far down in the Southland, and I am back again, thanks be, in the land of wind and snow where life lives but that was in the days when i was a wretch thing that crept and crawled and shrunk when the wind blew and feared the snow so they sent me away down there to the world of the sun where the wind and the snow are afraid and the sun was kind to me and the soft air that does not move lay around me like folds of down and the poor creeping life in me winked in the light and stared out at the wide caressing air stared away to the north to the land of wind and rain where my heart was my heart that would be at home yes there in the tender south my heart was bitter and bowed for the love of the singing wind and the fruit whose edge was death bitter and bowed for the strength to bear that was gone and the strength to love that abode day after day i climbed the hills with my face to the north and home and there, on those southern heights, where the air was resin and balm, there smote on my ears the sound that all the wind of the north can never sing down again. The sound I shall hear till I stand at the door of the lost silence. Cling, clang, cling, from the Georgian hills it sounds, and the snow and the storm cannot drown it, the far of terrible music of a chain gang. I met it there on the road, face to face, with all the light of the sun upon it, do you know what it is? Do you know that every day men run in long procession? Upon the road they build for others safe and easy going, bound to a chain, and that other men, with guns upon their shoulders, ride beside them, with orders to kill if the living links break. There stretched before me a serpent of human bodies, bound to the iron and wrapped in the merciless folds of justified cruelty. Clang, cling, clang. There was an order given, the living chain divided. Groups fell to work upon the road, and then I saw and heard a miracle. Have you ever out of a drowsy, lazy conviction that all knowledges, all arts, all dreams are only patient sums of many toils of many millions dead and living, suddenly started into an uncanny consciousness that knowledges and arts and dreams are things more real than any living being ever was, which suddenly reveal themselves, unasked and unawaited, in the most obscure corners of soul life, flashing out in prismatic glory to dazzle and shock all your security of thought 
toppling it with vague questions of what is reality that you cannot silence when you hear that an untaught child is able he knows not how to do the works of the magicians of mathematics has it never seemed to you that suddenly all books were swept away and there before you stood a superb sphinx like creation mathematics itself posing problems to men whose eyes are cast down and all at once out of whim incorporating itself in that wide-eyed mysterious child have you ever felt that all the works of the masters were swept aside in the burst of a singing voice unconscious that it sings and that music itself a master presence has entered the throat and sung no you have never felt it but you have never heard the chain gang sing their faces were black and brutal and hopeless their brows were low their jaws were heavy their eyes were hard three hundred years of a scorn that brands had burned its scar upon the face and form of ignorance ignorance that had sought dully stupidly blindly and been answered with that pitiless brand but wide beyond the limits of hymen and his little scorn the great sweet old music soul the chords of the world smote through the black man's fibre in the days of the making of man and it sings it sings with its ever thrumming strings through all the voices of the chain gang and never one so low that it does not fill with the humming vibrancy that quivers and bursts out singing things always new and new and new i heard it that day the leader struck his pick into the earth and for a moment whistled like some wild free living flute in the forest then his voice floated out like a low booming wind crying an instant and fell there was the measure of a grave in the fall of it another voice rose up and lifted the dead note aloft like a mourner raising his beloved with a kiss it drifted away to the hills and the sun then many voices rolled forward like a great plunging wave in a chorus never heard before perhaps never again for each man sang his own song as it came yet all blent the words were few simple filled with a great plaint the wail of the sea was in it and no man knew what his brother would sing yet added his own without thought as the rhythm swept on and none of us knew what note its fellow voice would sing yet they fell in one another as the billow falls in the trough or rose to the crest one upon the other one within the other over under all in the great wave and now one led and others followed then it dropped back and another swelled upward and every voice was soloist and chorister and never one seemed conscious of itself but only to sing out the great song and always as the voices rose and sank the axes swung and fell and the lean white face of a man with a gun looked on with a stolid paralyzed smile oh that wild sombre melody that long appealing plaint with its hope laid beyond death that melody that was made only there just now before me and passing away before me if i could only seize it hold it stop it from passing that all the world might hear the song of a chain gang might know that here in these red georgian hills convicts black brutal convicts are making the music that is of no man's compelling that floods like the tide and ebbs away like the tide and will not be held and is gone far away and forever out into the abyss where the voices of the centuries have drifted and are lost something about jesus and a lamp in the darkness a gulfing darkness oh in the mass of sunshine must they still cry for light all around the sweep and the glory of shimmering ether sun sun a world of sun and these still calling for light sun for the road sun for the stones sun for the red clay and no light for this dark living clay only heat that burns and blaze that blinds but does not lift the darkness and lead me to that lamp the pathetic prayer for light went trembling away out into the luminous gulf of day and the axes swung and fell and the grim dry face of a man with a gun looked on with its frozen smile so long as they sing they work said the smile still and ironical a friend to them that's got no friend men of sorrows lifted up unto golgotha in the day when the forces of the law and the might of social order set you there in the moment of your pain and desperate accusation against heaven when that piercing eloi eloi lama sabachthani went up to a deaf sky did you presage this desolate appeal coming to you out of us unlived deaths of nineteen hundred years hopeless hope that cries to the dead futile pleading that the cup may pass while still the lips drink 
for as of old order and the law in shining helmets and gleaming spears ring round the felon of golgotha so stands they still in that lean merciless figure with its shouldered gun and passive smile and the moon that died within the place of skulls is born again in this great dark cry rising up against the sun if but the living might hear it not the dead for these are dead who walk about with vengeance and despite within their hearts and scorn for things dark and lowly in the odour of self-righteousness with self-vaunting wisdom in their souls and pride of race and iron shod order and the preservation of things that are walking stones are these that cannot hear but the living are those who seek to know who wot not of things lowly or things high but only of things wonderful and who turn sorrowfully from things that are hoping for things that may be if these should hear the chain gang chorus seize it make all the living hear it see it if from among themselves one man might find the lamp lift it up paint for all the world these georgian hills these red sunburned roads these tolling figures with their rhythmic axes these brutal unillumined faces dull groping death covered and then unloose that song upon their ears till they feel the smitten quivering hearts of the sons of music beating against their own and under and over and around it the chain that the dead have forged clinking between the heartbeats clang 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 it is sundown they are running over the red road now the voices are silent only the chain clings and of a chain gang Section three of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heart of Angelilo of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. Some women are born to love stories as the sparks fly upward. You see it every time they glance at you, and you feel it every time they lay a finger on your sleeve. There was a party the other night, and a four-year-old baby who couldn't sleep for the nurse crept down into the parlor half-frightened to death and transfixed with wonderment at the crude performances of an obtuse visitor who was shouting out the woes of Othello. One kindly little woman took the baby in her arms and said, What would they do to you if you made all that noise? Weep me, whispered the child, her round black eyes half admiration and half terror, and altogether coquettish, as she hid and peered round the woman's neck, and every man in the room forthwith fell in love with her, and wanted to smother his face in the bewitching rings of dark hair that crowned the dainty head, and carry her about on his shoulders, or get down on his hands and knees to play horse for her or let her walk on his neck or obliterate his dignity in any other way she might prefer the boys tolerated their fathers with a superior her fourteen or fifteen years from now they will be playing the humble cousin of the horse before the same little ring-haired lady and having sported nick bottom's ears to no purpose half a dozen or so will go off and hang themselves or turn monk or become bold bad men and revenge themselves on the sex but her conquest will go on and when those gracious rings are white as snow the children of those boys will follow in their grandfather's and father's steps and dangle after her and make drawings on their fly leaves of that sweet kiss cup of a mouth of hers and call her their elder sister and other devotional names and the other girls of her generation who were not born with that marvellous entangling grace in every line and look will dread her and spite her and feel mean satisfaction when some poor old fool does swallow laudanum on her account smiles of glacial virtue will creep over their faces like slippery sunshine when one by one her devotees come trailing off to them to say that such a woman could never feel a man's heart nor become the ornament of his hearthstone acquired virtues that wear are all their desire of course they have just been studying her character and that of a foolish man who dance her attendance but even those are not doing it with any serious motives and the neglected girls will serve him with home-made cake and wine which he will presently convert into agony in that peel shell ear of hers and all the while the baby will have done nothing but be what she was born to be through none of her own choosing 
which is her lot and portion and that is another thing the gods will have to explain when the day comes that they go on trial before men which is the real day of judgment but this isn't the baby's story which has yet to be made but the story of one who somehow received a wrong portion some inadvertent little angel in the destiny shop took down her name when the heroine of a romance was called for and put her where she shouldn't have been and then ran off to play no doubt not stopping to look twice for even the most insouciant angel that looked twice would have seen that if he was no woman to play the game of hearts and there's only one thing more undiscerning than an angel and that is a social reformer if he ran up against both they say she had blood in her girlhood that it shone red and steady through that thin pure skin of hers but when i saw her with her nursing baby in her arms down in the smashing grime of london there was only a fluctuant blush a sort of pink gust of blood hovering back and forth on her face and that was for shame of the poverty of her need bare room not that she had ever known riches she was the daughter of scotch peasants and had gone out to service when she was still a child her chest was hollowed in and her back bowed with that unnatural labor there was no gloss on the pale sandy hair no wilding tendrils clinging round the straight smooth forehead no light of coquetry or grace in the glimmering blue eyes no beauty in her at all unless it lay in the fine hard sculptured line of her nose and mouth and chin when she turned her head sideways you could read in that line that having spoken a word to her heart she would not forget it nor unsay it and if it took her down into getsman she would never cry out though by all forsaken and that was where it had taken her then some ready condemner of all that has been tried for less than a thousand years will say it was because she had the just reward of those who holding that love is its own sanction and that it cannot be anything but degraded by seeking permissions from social authorities live their love lives without the consent of church and state but you and i know that the same dark garden has awaited the woman whose love has been blessed by both and that many such a life lamp has flickered out in a night as profound as poverty and utter loneliness could make it so if it was justice to effie what is it to that other woman in truth justice had nothing to do with it she loved the wrong man that was all and married or unmarried it would have been the same for a formula doesn't make a man nor the lack of it and make him the fellow was superior in intellect it is honesty only which can wring so much from those who knew them both for as to any other thing she sat as high over him as the stars are not that he was an actively bad man just one of those weak uncertain tumbling about characters having sense enough to know it is a fine thing to stand alone and vanity enough to want the name without the game and cowardice enough to creep around anything stronger than itself and hang there and spread itself about and say lo how straight am i and if the stronger thing happens to be a father or a brother or some such tolerant piece of friendly self-sufficient energy he amuses himself a while and finally gives the creeper a shake and says here now go hang on somebody else if you can stand alone and the world says he should have done it before but if it happens to be a mother or a sister or a wife or a sweetheart she encourages him to think he is a wonderful person that all she does is really his own merit and she is proud and glad to serve him if after a while she doesn't exactly believe it any more she says and does the same and the world says she is a fool which she is but if in some sudden spurt of masculine self-assertiveness she decides to fling him off the world says she is an unwomanly woman which again she is so much the better if his creeper doubled in literature he wanted to be a translator and several other things his appearance was mild and gentlemanly even super modest he always spoke respectfully of effie and as if momentously impressed with a sense of duty towards her they had started out to realize a free life together and the glory of a new ideal had become then forward so no doubt he believed for a pretender always deceives himself worse than anybody else but still at that particular period he used to droop his head wearily and admit that he had made a great mistake it was nobody's fault but his own but of course effie and he were hardly fitted for each other she could not well enter into his hopes and ambitions never having had the opportunity to develop when she was younger he had hoped to stimulate her in that direction but he feared it was too late 
so he said in a delicate and gentlemanly way as he went from one house to the other and was invited to dinner and supper and made himself believe he was looking for work if he meanwhile was taking home boys caps to make and roaring along incredibly on bread and tea and walking the streets with the baby in her arms when she had no caps to make of course when a man drinks other people's teas a great many times and sits in their houses and borrows odd shillings now and then and assumes the gentleman he is ultimately brought to the necessity of asking someone to tea with him so one spring night the creeper approached effie rather dubiously with a statement that he had asked two or three acquaintances to come in the next evening and he supposed she would need to prepare tea the girl was just fainting from starvation then and she asked him where really where he thought she was to get it he cast about a while in his pusillanimous way for things that she might do and finally proposed that she pawn the baby's dress the white dress she had made from one of her own girlhood dresses and the only thing it had to wear when she took it out for air that was the limit even for effie she said she would take anything of her own if she had it but not the baby's and she turned her face to the wall and clung to the child when the tea time came next day she went out with the baby and walked up and down the surging london streets looking in the windows and crushing back tears what the creeper did with his guests she never knew for she did not return till long after dusk when she was too weary to wander any more and she found no one there but himself and a dark stranger who spoke little and with an italian accent but who measured her with serious intense eyes he listened to the creeper but he looked at her she was quite fagged out and more bloodless than ever as she sat motionless on the edge of the bed when he went away he lifted his hat to her with the grace of an old-time courtier and begged her pardon if he had intruded some days after that he came in again and brought a toy for the baby and asked her if he might carry the child out a little for her it looked sickly shut up there but he knew it must be heavy for her to carry the creeper suddenly discovered that he could carry the baby all this happened in the days when a pious queen sat on the throat of spain with eyes turned upward in much holiness she failed to see the things done in her presence or hear the groans that rose up from the zero chamber in the fortress of montjuit the old europe heard and even in america the echo rang while she told her beads her minister gave the order to torture the anarchist and scared with red-hot irons maim and deform and madden with the nameless horrors that the good devised to correct the bad even unto this day the evidences of that infamous order live but two men do not live the one who gave the order and the one who revenged it it happened one night in april that effie and the creeper and their sometime visitor met all three in one of those long low smothering london halls where many movements have originated which in their developed proportions have taken possession of the house of commons and even staggered the dust in the house of lords there was a crowd of excited people talking all degrees of sense and nonsense in every language of the continent letters smuggled from the prison had been received new tales of torture were passing from mouth to mouth fresh propositions to arouse a general protest from civilization were bubbling up with the anger of every indignant man and woman drifting to the buzzing nuts if he heard someone translating it was the letter of a tortured nogues who a month later was shot beneath the fortress wall the words smote her ears like something hot and stinging you know i am one of the three accusers the other two are Aseri and molas who figure in the trial i could not bear the atrocious tortures of so many days on my arrest i spent eight days without food or drink obliged to walk continually to and fro or be flogged and as if that did not suffice i was made to trot as though i were a horse trained at the riding school until worn with fatigue i fell to the ground and then the hangman burnt my lips with red hot irons and when i declared myself the author of the attempt they replied you do not tell the truth we know that the author is another one but we want to know your accomplices besides you still retain six bombs and along with little ola you deposited two bombs in the roof vivalier who are your accomplices in spite of my desire to make an end of it i could not answer anything whom should i accuse since all are innocent 
Finally, six comrades were placed before me, whom I had to accuse, and of whom I beg pardon. Thus the declarations and the accusations that I made. I cannot finish. The hangmen are coming. No guess. Sick with horror, Effie would have gone away, but her feet were like lead. She heard the next letter, the pathetic prayer of Sebastian Sonia. Indistinctly, the tortures had already seared her ears, but the crying for help seemed to go up over her head like great sobs. She felt herself wash round, sinking in the desperate pain of it. The piteous reiteration, listen you with your honest hearts, you with your pure souls, good and right-minded people, good and right-feeling people, wail through her like the wild pleading of a child who, shrieking under the whip, dear papa, good, sweet papa, please don't whip me, please, please, seeks terror wrong flattery to escape the lash, the last cry, aid us in our helplessness, think of our misery, made her quiver like a reed, she walked away and sat down in a corner alone. What could she do? What could anyone do? Miserable creature that she was herself. Her own misery seemed so worthless beside that prison cry. And she thought, on, why does he want to live at all? Why does anyone want to live? Why do I want to live myself? After a while, the creeper and his friend came to her, and the latter sat down beside her, undemonstrative as usual. At the next burst in the room, they two were left alone. She looked at him once as she said, What do you think the people will do about it? He glanced at the crowd with a faint smile. Do? Talk. In a little time he said quietly, It does you no good here. I will take you home and come back for David afterward. She had no idea of contradicting him, so they went out together. At the threshold of her room, he said firmly, I will come in for a few minutes. I have to speak to you. She struck a light, put the baby on the bed, and looked at him questioningly. He sat down with his back against the wall, and with rigidly folded arms, stared straight ahead of him. Seeing that he did not speak, she said softly, falling into her native dialect, as all Scotch women do when they feel most, I cannot get that poor creature's cries out of my head. It's no human. No, he said shortly, and then with a sudden look at her, Effie, what do you think love is? She answered him with surprised eyes, and said nothing. He went on, You love a child, don't you? You do for it, you serve it, that shows you love it. But do you think it's love that makes David act as he does to you? If he loved you, would he let you work as you work? Would he leave off you? Wouldn't he wear the flesh of his fingers instead of yours? He doesn't love you, he isn't worth you. He isn't a bad man, but he isn't worth you and you make him less worth. You ruin him, you ruin yourself, you kill the child. I can't see it any more. I come here and I see you weaker every time, whiter, thinner, and I know if you keep on you will die. I can't see it. I want you to leave him. Let me work for you. I don't make much, but enough to let you rest, at least till you are well. I would wait till you left him of yourself, but I can't wait when I see you dying like this. I don't want anything of you except to serve you, to serve a child because it's yours. Come away tonight. You can have my room. I'll go somewhere else. Tomorrow I will find you a better place. You needn't see him any more. I'll tell him myself. He won't do anything. Don't be afraid. Come. And he stood up. If he had sat astonished and dumb, now she looked up at the dark tense eyes above her and said quietly, I did not understand. A sharp contraction went across the strong bent face. No, you don't understand what you're doing with yourself. You don't understand that I love you, and I can't see it. I don't ask you to love me. I ask you to let me serve you. Only a little, only so much as to give you health again. Is that too much? You don't know what you are to me. Others love beauty, but I, I see in you the eternal sacrifice. Your thin fingers that always work. Your face, when I look at it, it's just a white shadow. You are the child of the people that dies without crying. Oh, let me give yourself for you and leave this man who doesn't care for you, doesn't know you, thinks you beneath him, uses you. I don't want you to be his slave anymore. If he clasped her hands and look at them, then she looked at the sleeping baby, smoothed the quilt and said quietly, I didn't take him that day to leave him the morn. It's 
no my fault if you're deaf about me the dark face sharpened as one sees the agony in a dying man but his voice was very gentle speaking always in his blood english no there's no fault in you at all did i accuse you the girl walked to the window and looked out some way it was a relief from the burning eyes which seemed to fill the room no matter that she did not look at them and staring off into the twinkling london night she heard again the terrible sobs of sebastian sonia's litter rising up and drowning her with its misery without turning around she said low and hard i wonder you can think about those things and yundel's burning men alive the man drew his hand across his forehead would you like to hear that they one the worst of them was dead i think the word would not be muckled the word of she answered still looking away from him he came up and laid his hand on her shoulder will you kiss me once i'll never ask again she shook him off i did not feel for it good-bye then i'll go back for david and he returned to the hall and got the creeper and told him very honestly what had taken place and the creeper to his credit be it said respected him for it and talked a great deal about being better in future to the girl the two men parted at the foot of the stairs and the last words that echoed through the hallway were no i am going away but you will hear of me some day now what went on in his heart that night no one knows nor what indecision still kept him lingering fitfully about effie's street a few days more nor when the indecision finally ceased for no one spoke to him after that except as casual acquaintances meet and in a week he was gone but what he did the whole world knows for even the queen of spain came out of her prayers to hear how her torturing prime minister had been shot at santa Agueda by a stern-faced man who when the widow grief mad spit in his face quietly whipped his cheek saying madame i have no quarrel with women a few weeks later they garroted him and he said one word before he died one only germinal over there in the long low london hall the gabbling was hushed and someone murmured how he had sat silent in the corner that night when all were talking the creeper passed round a book containing the history of the tortures watching it jealously all the while for said he angiolillo gave it to me himself he had it in his own hands effie lay beside the baby in her room and hid her face in the pillow to keep out the stare of the burning eyes that were dead and over and over again she repeated was it my fault was it my fault the hot summer air lay still and smothering and the immense murmur of the city came muffled like thunder below the horizon her heart seemed beating against the walls of a padded room and gradually without losing consciousness she slipped into the world of illusion around her grew the stifling atmosphere of the torture chamber of Monjuit, and the choked cries of men in agony she was sure that if she looked up she should see the demoniac face of portas the torturer she tried to cry mercy mercy but her dry lips clave she had a whirling sensation and the illusion changed now there was the clank of soldiers arms a moment of insufferable stillness as the garrote shaped itself out of the shadows in her eyes then loud and clear breaking the sullen quiet like the sharp ringing of a storm bringing wind germinal she sprang up the long vibration of the bell of st pacras was waving through the room but to her it was a prolongation of a word germinal germinal then suddenly she threw out her arms in the darkness and whispered hoarsely eh hey, i'll kiss you the new an hour later she was back at the old question was it my fault poor girl it is all over now and all the same to the grass that roots in her bone whether it was her fault or not for the end that the men who had loved her foresaw came through it was slow in the coming let the creeper get credit for all that he did he stiffened up in a year or so and went to paris and got some work and there the worn little creature went to him and wrote to her old friends that she was better off at last but it was too late for that thin shell of a body that had starved so much at the first trial she broke and died and so she sleeps and is forgotten and the careless boy angel who mixed all these destinies up so unobservantly has never yet whispered her name in the ear of the widowed lady canovas del castillo nor will the birds that fly thither carry it now 
for it was not Effie. End of the Heart of Angelillo. Section 4 of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches, and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Reward of an Apostate of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches, and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. I have sinned, and I am rewarded according to my sin which was great there is no forgiveness for me and let no man think there is forgiveness for sin the gods cannot forgive this was my sin and this is my punishment that i forsook my god to follow a stranger only a while a very brief brief while and i would have returned there was no more returning i cannot worship any more that is my punishment i cannot worship any more oh that my god will none of me that is an old sorrow my god was beauty and i am all unbeautiful and ever was there is no grace in these harsh limbs of mine nor was at any time i to whom the glory of a lit eye was as the shining of stars in a deep well have only dull and faded eyes and always had the chiseled lip and chin wherever runs the radiance of life in bumbling gleams the cup of living wine was never mine to taste or kiss i am earth colored and for my own ugliness sit in the shadow but the sunlight may not see me nor the beloved of my god but once in my hidden corner behind the curtain of shadows i blink at the glory of the world and had such joy of it as only the ugly know sitting silent and worshipping forgetting themselves and forgotten here in my brain it glowed the shimmering of the dying sun upon the shore the long war line between the sand and sea where the sliding foam caught fire and burned to death here in my brain it shone the white moon and the wrinkling river running away a dancing ghost line in the illimitable night here in my brain rose the mountain curves the great still world of stone summit upon summit sweeping skyward lonely and conquering here in my brain my little brain behind this tiny ugly wall of bone stretched over with its dirty yellow skin glittered the far high blue desert with its sand of stars as i have watched it nights and nights alone hid in the shadows of the prairie grass here rolled and swelled the seas of corn and blossoming fields of nodding bloom and flower flies on their hovering wings went flickering up and down and the quick spring of live limb things went scattering dew across the sun and singing streams went shining down the rocks spreading bright veils upon the crags here in my brain my silent unrevealing brain were the eyes i loved the lips i dared not kiss the sculptured heads and tendril hair they were here always in my wonder house my house of beauty the temple of my god i shut the door on common life and worship here and no bright living flying thing in whose body beauty dwells as guest can guess the ecstatic joy of a brown silent creature a toad thing squatting on the shadowed ground self-blotted motionless thrilling with the presence of all beauty though it has no part therein but the gods are many and once a strange god came to me sharp upon the shadowy ground he stood and beckoned me with knotted fingers there was no beauty in his lean figure and sunken cheeks but up and down the muscles ran like snakes beneath his skin and his dark eyes had sombre fires in them and as i looked at him i felt the leap of prison forces in myself in the earth in the air in the sun all throbbed with the pulse of a wild god's heart beauty vanished from my wonder house and where his images had been i heard the clang and roar of machinery the forging of links that stretched to the sun chains for the tides chains for the winds and curious lights went shining through thick walls as through air and down through the shell of the world itself to the great furnaces within into those seething depths the god's eyes peered smiling and triumphing then with an up glance at the sky and a waste glance at me he strode off this is my great sin for which there is no pardon i followed him the rude god energy followed him and in that abundant moment 
sought to be quit of beauty which had given me nothing and to be worshipper of him to whom i was akin ugly but sinuous resolute daring defiant maker and breaker of things remolder of the world i followed him i would have run abreast with him i loved him not with that still ecstasy of flooding joy wherewith my own god filled me of all but with impetuous eager fires that burned and beat through all the blood threads of me i love you love me back i cried and would have flung myself upon his neck then he turned on me with a ruthless blow and fled away over the world leaving me crippled stricken powerless a fire's pain driving through my veins gusts of pain and i crept back into my old cavern stumbling blind and deaf only for the haunting vision of my shame and the rushing sound of fevered blood the pain is gone i see again i care no more for the taunt and blow of the fire's god who was never mine but in my wonder house it is all still and bare no image lingers on the blank mirrors any more no singing bell floats in the echoless dome forms rise and pass but neither mountain curve nor sand nor sea nor shivering river nor the faces of the flowers no flowering faces of my god's beloved touch aught within me now not one poor thrill of vague delight for me who felt the glory of the stars within my fingertips it slips past me like water brown without and clay within no wonder now behind the ugly wall an empty temple i cannot worship i cannot love i cannot care all my life service is unweighed against that faithless hour of my forswearing it is just it is the law i am forsworn and the gods have given me the reward of an apostate and of the reward of an apostate section five of selected works letters sketches and stories by voltairine de claire this is a library works recording all library works recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org at the end of the alley first of selected works letters sketches and stories by voltairine de claire it is a long narrow pocket opening on a little street which runs like a tortuous seam up and down the city over there it was at the end of the summer and in summer in the evening the mouth of the pocket is hard to find because of the people in it and about who sit across the passage gasping at the dirty winds that come loafing down the street like crafty beggars seeking a hole to sleep in like mean beggars bereft of the spirit of free windhood down in the pocket itself the air is quite dead one feels oneself enveloped in a scum covered pool of it and at every breath long filaments of invisible roots swamp roots tear and tangle in your floundering lungs i had to go to the very end to the bottom of the pocket there in the deepest of these alley holes lives the woman to whom i am indebted for the whiteness of this waist i wear how she does it i don't know poverty works miracles like that just as the black marsh mud gives out lilies at the very last door i knock and presently a man's voice weak and suffocated called from a window above i explain there's a chair there sit down she'll be home soon and the voice was caught in a cuff this then was the consumptive husband she had told me of i looked up at the square hole dimly outlined in the darkness whence the cuff issued and suddenly felt a horrible pressure at my heart and a curious sense of entanglement as if all the invisible webs of disease had momentarily acquired a conscious sense of prey within their clutch and tightened on it like an octopus the haunting terror of the unknown the dim horror of an inimic presence recoiled before the merciless creeping and floating of an enemy one cannot grasp or fight repulsive turning from a thing that has reached behind while you have been seeking to face it that is there awaiting you with the frightful ironic laughter of a silence all this swept round and through me as i stared up through the night up there on the bed he was lying he who had been meshed in the fatal web for three long years and was struggling still in the darkness i felt his breath draw the sharp barking of a dog came as a relief i turned to the broken chair and sat down to wait the alley was hemmed in by a high wall and from the farther side of it there towered up four magnificent old trees whose great crowns sent down a whispering legend of vanished forests and the limitless sweep of clean air that had washed through them long ago 
and that would never come again how long how long since those far days of purity before the plague spot of men had crept upon them how strong those proud old giants were that had not yet been strangled how beautiful they were how mean and ugly were the misshapen things that sat in the doorways of the fall dens that they had made chattering chattering as ages ago the apes had chattered in the forest what curious beasts they were with their paws and heads sticking out of the coverings they had twisted round their bodies chattering chattering always and always moving about unable to understand the still strong groves of silence so a half hour passed at last i saw a parting in the group of bodies across the entrance of the pocket and a familiar weary figure carrying a basket coming down the brickway she stopped halfway where a widening of the alley furnished the common drying place and a number of clothes lines crossed and recrossed each other casting a net of shadows on the pavement after a glance at the sky which had clouded over she sighed heavily and again advanced in the sickly light of the alley lamp the rounded shoulders seemed to droop like an old crown's yet the woman was still young that she might not be startled i called good evening the answer was spoken in that tone of forced cheerfulness which the wretch always give to their employers but she sank upon the step with the habitual my but i'm glad to sit down of one who seldom sits tired out i suppose the day has been so hot yes and i've got to go to work and iron again till eleven o'clock and it's awful hot in that kitchen i don't mind the washing so much in summer i wash out here but it's hot ironing are you in a hurry i said no and sat on how much rent do you pay i asked seven dollars three rooms yes one over the other yes it's an awful rent and he won't fix anything the door is half of its hinges and the paper is a sight have you lived here long over three years we moved here before he got sick i don't keep nothing right now but it used to be nice it's so quiet back here away from the street you don't hear no noise that fence ought to be whitewashed i used to keep it white and everything clean and it was so nice to sit out here in summer under them trees you could just think you were in the park a curious wonder went through me somewhere back in me a voice was saying to him that hat shall be given and from him that hat not it shall be taken away even that which he had this horrible pool had been nice to her again i felt the abyss seizing me with its tentacles and high overhead in the tree crowns i seemed to hear a spectral mockery of water yes i forced myself to say they are splendid trees i wonder they have lived so long tis funny ain't it that's a great big yard in there the man that used to own it was a gardener and there's a lot of the curiousest flowers there yet but he's dead now and the folks that got it don't keep up nothing they are waiting to sell it i suppose above over our heads the racking cough sounded again ain't it terrible she murmured day and night day and night he don't get no rest and neither do i it's no wonder some people commit suicide does he ever speak of it i asked her voice dropped to a semi-whisper not now so much since the church peoples got hold of him he used to i think he'd had done it if it hadn't been for them but they've been kind of talking to him lately and telling him it wouldn't be right on account of the insurance you know my heart gave a wild bound of revolt and i shut my teeth fast oh man man what have you made of yourself more stupid than all the beasts of the earth for a dull of the things you make to be robbed of living to be robbed of and poisoned with you consent to the death that eats with a million mouths eats inexorably you submit to unamiable torture in the holy name of insurance and in the name of insurance this miserable woman keeps alive the bones of a man i took my bundle and went and all the way i felt myself tearing through the tendrils of death that hung and swayed from the noisome wall and caught at things as they passed and all the way there pressed upon me pictures of the skeleton and the woman clothed in firm flesh young and joyous and thrilling with the love of the well and strong ah if someone had said to her then some day you will slave to keep him alive through fruitless agonies that for your last reward you may take the price of his pain end of at the end of the alley first section six of selected works letters sketches and stories by Voltairine de claire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org alone sagan 
of selected works, letters, sketches, and stories by Voltairine de Clare. I was wrong. I thought she wanted the insurance money, but I misunderstood her. I found it out one wild October day more than a year later, when for the second time I sought the end of the alley. The sufferer had suffered out. The gaunt and wasted shell of a man lay no more by the window in the upper story. The woman was free. Rest at last, I thought, for both of them. But it was not as I thought. I expected ease to come into the woman's drawn face and relaxation to her stooping figure. But something else came upon both, something quite unwanted and inexplicable, a wandering look in the eyes, a stupid drop to the mouth, an uncertainty in her walk as of one who is half-minded to go back and look for something. There was too an irritating irregularity in the performance of her work, which began to be annoying. At last, on that October day, this new unreliability reached the limit of provocation. I was leaving the city. I needed my laundry. Needed it at once, and here it was four o'clock in the afternoon, the train due at night, and packing impossible till the wash came. It was five days overdue. The wind was howling furiously the rain driving in sheets, but there was no alternative. I must get to the end of the alley and back somehow. The grey rain-drenched atmosphere was still greyer in the alley, still still greyer at the end, and what with the grey of it and the rain of it, I could scarcely see the thing that sat facing me when I opened the door, a sort of human blur, hunched in a rocking chair, its head sunken on its breast, in response to my startled exclamation, the face was lifted vacantly for a second, and then dropped again. But I had seen, drunk, and dead drunk, and this woman had never drunk. I looked around the wretched room. By the window where the grey light trailed in, stood a table covered with unwashed dishes. Some late flies were crawling in the gutters of slop, besotted derelicts of insects, stupidly staggering up and down the cracked china. On the stove stood this number of flat irons, but there was no fire. A mass of unironed clothes lay on an old couch and over the backs of two unoccupied chairs. On the wall above the couch hung the portrait of a dead man. I walked to a slumping figure in the rocker and with ill-contained brutality demanded, So this is why you did not bring my clothes. Where are they? I heard my own voice cutting like the edge of a knife and felt half ashamed when that weak, shaking thing lifted up its foolish face and stared at me with watery, uncomprehending eyes. My clothes, I reiterated, are they here or upstairs? Guess so, stammered the uncertain voice. G guess so. Nothing for it but to find them myself, I muttered, beginning the search through the pile on the couch. Nothing of mine there, so I needs must climb to the Golgotha on the second floor, from which the cross had disappeared, but which still bore traces of its victim's long crucifixion. A pair of old bed slippers still by the window, a sleeping cap on the wall. Some cannot but leave so the things that have touched their dead. One by one I found the rough dry garments here. They are in the hallway in the garret, hanging or crumpled up among dozens of others. And all the while I hunted the rain beat and the wind blew. And a low third sound kept mingling with them, rising from the lower floor. My heart smote me when I heard it, for I knew it was the woman sobbing. The self-righteous Pharisee within me gave an impatient sneer. Alcohol tears, but something else clutched at my throat, and I found myself glancing at the dead man's shoes. When I went downstairs, I avoided the rocking chair, tied up my bundle, counted out the money, laid it on the table, and then turning round, said deliberately and harshly, where is your money? Don't buy whiskey with it, Mrs. Bussert. Crying had a little sobered her. She looked up, still with less light in her face than in an intelligent dog's, but with some dim self-consciousness. It was as a face that had appeared behind deforming bubbles of water. She half lifted her hand, let it fall, and stammered, No, I won't. I won't. It don't do nobody no good. The senseless desire to preach says hold of me. Mrs. Bussert, I cried out, Aren't you ashamed of yourself? A woman like you, who went through so much and so long and so bravely, and now, when you could get along all right to act like this, the soggy mouth dropped open, the glazy eyes stared at me, fixedly and foolishly, then shifted to the portrait on the wall, and with a mawkish simper, as of some old drab playing sixteen, she slobbered out, nodding to the portrait, all for the love of him. It was so utterly ludicrous that I laughed. Then a cold rage took me. Look here, I said. 
and again i heard my own voice grim and quiet cutting the air like a whip if you believe as i have heard you say that your husband can look down on you from anywhere remember you couldn't do a thing to hurt him worse than you are doing now love indeed the lash went home the stricken figure huddled closer the voice came out like a dumb thing's moan oh i'm all alone then suddenly i understood i had taken it for mockery and profanation that leering look at the window on the wall that driveling stammer all for the love of him and it had been a solemn thing no lover's word spoken in the morning of youth with the untried day before it under the seductive witchery of answering breath and kisses rushing blood and throbbing bodies but the word of a woman bent with service seam with labor haggard with watching the word of a woman who at the washtub had kept her sufferer by the work of her hands and watched him between the snatches of her sleep the immemorial passion of a common heart that is not much that had not much and has lost all years were in it for years she had had her burden to carry and she had carried it to the edge of the grave there it had fallen from her and her arms were empty nothing to do any more alone she sat up suddenly with a momentary flare of light in her face as long as i had him she said i could do i thought i'd be glad when he was gone a many and many a time but i rather he was up there yet i did everything i didn't put him away mean there was a hundred and twenty-five dollars insurance i spent it all on him he was covered with flowers the flare died down and she fell together like a collapsing bag i saw the grey vacancy moving inward toward the last spark of intelligence in her eyes as an ashing coal whitens inward toward the last dull red point of fire then this heap of rags shuddered with an inhuman whine alone in the crowding shadows i felt the desolation pressing me like a vice behind that sunken heap in the chair gathered a midnight spectre for a moment i caught a flash from its royal malignant eyes the monarch of human ruins the murderous bridegroom of widowed souls king alcohol after all as well that way as another i muttered and aloud but the whip cord had gone out of my voice the money's on the table she did not hear me the bridegroom had given his beloved sleep i went out softly into the wild rain and overheard among the lashing arms of the leafless trees and around the alley pocket the wind was whining alone end of alone Sagon. Section 7 of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches, and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To Strive and Fail of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches, and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. There was a lonely wind crying around the house and wailing away through the twilight like a child that has been refused and gone of crying every now and then the trees shivered with it and dropped a few leaves that splashed against the windows like big soft tears and then fell down on the dark dying grass and lay there till the next wind rose and whirled them away rain was gathering close by the grey patch of light within the room a white face bent over a small table and dust dim fingers swept across the strings of a scissor the low pathetic opening chords of albert hubsclegg well for a moment like the wind then a false note sounded and the player threw her arms across the table and rested her face upon them what was the use she knew how it ought to be but she could never do it never make the string strike true to the song that was sounding within sounding as the wind and the rain and the falling leaves sounded it as long ago the wizard albert had heard and conjured it out of the sound sea before the little black notes that carried the message over the world were written the weary brain wandered away over the mystery of her notes and she whispered dully a sign to the eye and a sound to the ear and that is his gift to the world his will and his dead 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 he was so great and they are so silly those little black foolish dots and yet they are there and by them his soul sings the numb pain at her heart forced some sharp tears from the closed eyes she bent and unbent her fingers hopelessly two or three times and then let them lie out flat and still it was not their fault not the fingers fault they could learn to do it 
if they only had the chance but they could never never have the chance they must always do something else always a hundred other things first always save and spare and patch and contrive there was never time to do the thing she longed for most only the odd moments the unexpected freedoms the stolen half hours in which to live one's highest dream only the cost away time for one's soul and every year the fleeting glory waned wavered sank away more and more sorrowfully into the grey soundless shadows of an unlived life once she had heard it so clearly long ago and the far of sun space wing singing fields of home the wild sweet choruses the songs no man had ever sung still she heard them sometimes in the twilight in the night when she sat alone and work was over high and thin and fading only sound ghost but still with the incomparable glory of a first revelation a song no one else has ever heard a marvel to be seized and bodied only they faded away into the nodding sleep that would conquer and in the light and rush of day were mournfully silent and she never captured them never would life was half over now with a thought she started up struck the chords again a world of plaint throbbing through the strings surely the wizard himself would have been satisfied but ah once more the fatal uncertainty of the fingers she bit the left hand savagely then touched it softly and remorsefully with the other murmuring poor fingers not your fault at last she rose and stood at the window looking out into the night and thinking of a ruined gift the noblest gift that had been hers and would die dumb thinking of the messages that had come to her up out of the silent dark and sunk back into it unsounded of the verses she would have given to the messages of the masters and never would give now and with a bitter compression of the lips she said well i was born to strive and fail and suddenly a rush of feeling swept her own life out of sight and away out in the deepening night she saw the face of an old sharp chin white-haired dead man he had been her father once strong and young with chestnut hair and gleaming eyes and with his own dream of what he had to do in life perhaps he too had heard sounds singing in the air a new message waiting for deliverance it was all over now he had grown old and thin-faced and white and had never done anything in the world at least nothing for himself his very own he had shown clovers thousands millions of stitches in his work-weary life no doubt there were still in existence scraps and fragments of his work in some old rag bag perhaps beautiful fine stitches into which the keen eyesight and the deaf hand had passed still showing the artist craftsman but that was not his work that was the service society had asked of him and he had rendered himself his own soul but wherein he was different from other men the unbought thing that the soul does for its own outpouring that was nowhere and over there among the low mounds of the soldiers graves his bed was made and he was lying in it straight and still with the rain crying softly above him he had been so full of the lust of life so alert so active and nothing of it all poor father you fell too she muttered softly and then behind the wraith of the dead man there rose an older picture a face she had never seen dead fifty years before but it shone through the other face and outshone it luminous with great suffering much overcoming and complete and final failure it was the face of a woman not yet middle age smitten with death with the horror of utter strangeness in the dying eyes the face of a woman lost in a strange city of a strange land and with her little crying helpless children about her facing the inexorable agony there on the pavement where she was sinking down and only foreign words falling in the dying ears she too had striven how she had striven against the abyss of poverty there in the old world against the load laid on her by nature law society the triumph god of terror against the inertia of another will she had bought couples with blood and spared and saved and endured and waited she had bent the gods to her will she had sent her husband to america the land of freedom and promise she had followed him at last over the great blue bitter water with its leaping mouth that had devoured one of her little ones upon the way she had been driven like a cow in the chambers at the landing stage she had been robbed of all but her ticket and with her little children had hungered for three days on the overland journey she had lived it through and set foot in the promised land but somehow the waiting face was not there had missed her or she him and lost and alone with death and the starving babes 
she sank at the foot of the soldier's monument and the black mist came down on the courageous eyes and the light was flickering out forever with a bitter cry the living figure in the room stretched its hands toward the vision in the night there was nothing there she knew it nothing in the heavens above nor the earth beneath to hear the cry not so much as a crumbling bone any more but she called brokenly oh why must she die so with nothing nothing and not one little reward after all that struggle to fall on the pavement and die in the hospital at last and shuddering with covered eyes and heavy breath she added wearily no wonder that i fail i come of those who failed my father his mother and before her behind the fading picture stretched dim long shadows of silent generations with rounded shoulders and bent backs and sullen conquered faces and they had all most likely dream of some wonderful thing they had to do in the world and all had died and left it undone and their work had been washed away as if writ in water and no one knew their dreams and of the fruit of their toil other men had eaten for that was the will of a triumph god but of themselves was left no trace no sound no word in the worst glory no carving upon stone no indomitable ghost shining from a written sign no song singing out of black foolish spots on paper nothing they were as though they had not been and as they all had died she too would die slave of a triple terror sacrificing the highest to the meanest that somewhere in some lighted ballroom or gas-bright theatre some piece of vacant flesh might wear one more jewel in her painted hair my soul she said bitterly my soul for their diamonds it was time to sleep for tomorrow work and of to strive and fail section eight of selected works letters sketches and stories by Voltairine de Clare. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the sorrows of a body of selected works letters sketches and stories by Voltairine de Clare. i have never wanted anything more than the wild creatures have a broad waft of clean air a day to lie on the grass at times with nothing to do but slip the blades through my fingers and look as long as i pleased at the whole blue arc and the screens of green and white between leave for a month to float and float along the salt crest and among the foam or roll with my naked skin over a clean long stretch of sunshiny sand food that i liked straight from the cool ground and time to taste its sweetness and time to rest after tasting sleep when it came and stillness that the sleep might leave me when it would not sooner air room light rest nakedness when i would not be clothed and when i would be clothed garments that did not fetter freedom to touch my mother earth to be with her in storm and shine as the wild things are this is what i wanted this and free contact with my fellows not to love and lie and be ashamed but to love and say i love and be glad of it to feel the currents of ten thousand years of passion flooding me body to body as the wild things meet i have asked no more but i have not received over me there sits that pitiless tyrant the soul and i am nothing it has driven me to the city where the air is fever and fire and said breathe this i would learn i cannot learn in the empty fields temples are here stay and when my poor stifled lungs have panted till it seem my chest must burst the soul has said i will allow you then an hour or two we will ride and i will take my book and read meanwhile and when my eyes have cried out with tears of pain for the brief vision of freedom drifting by only for leave to look at the great green and blue an hour after the long dull red horror of wars the soul has said i cannot waste the time altogether i must know read and when my ears have pled for the singing of the crickets and the music of the night the soul has answered no gongs and whistle and shrieks are unpleasant if you listen but school yourself to hearken to the spiritual voice and it will not matter when i have beat against my narrow confines of brick and mortar brick and mortar the soul has said miserable slave why are you not as i who in one moment fly to the utterest universe it matters not where you are i am free when i would have slept so that the lids fell heavily and i could not leave them the soul has struck me with a lash crying awake drink some stimulant for those shrinking nerves of yours 
there's no time to sleep till the work is done and the cursed poison worked upon me till its will was done when i would have dallied over my food the soul has ordered hurry hurry do i have time to waste on this disgusting scene fill yourself and be gone when i have envied the very dog rubbing its bare back along the ground in the sunlight the soul has exclaimed would you degrade me so far as to put yourself on a level with beasts and my bands were drawn tighter when i have looked upon my kind and longed to embrace them hungered wildly for the press of arms and lips the soul has commanded sternly cease vile creature fleshly lust eternal reproach will you forever shame me with your beastliness and i have always yielded mute joyless fettered i have trod the world of a soul's choosing and served and been unrewarded now i am broken before my time bloodless sleepless breathless half blind racked at every joint trembling with every leaf perhaps i have been too hard said the soul you shall have a rest the boon has come too late the roses are beneath my feet now but the perfume does not reach me the willows trail across my cheek and the great arc is overheard but my eyes are too weary to lift to it the wind is upon my face but i cannot bear my throat to its caress vaguely i hear the singing of the night through the long watches when sleep does not come but the answering vibration frills no more hands touch mine i long for them so once but i am as a corpse i remember that i wanted all these things but now the power to want is crushed from me and only the memory of my denial throbs on with its never dying pain and still i think if i were left alone long enough but already i hear the tyrant up there plotting to slay me yes it keeps saying it is about time i will not be chained to a rotting carcass if my days are to pass in perpetual idleness i may as well be annihilated i will make the wretch do me one more service you have clamoured to be naked in the water go now and lie in it forever yes that is what it is saying and i the sea stretches down there and of the sorrows of a body section nine of selected works letters sketches and stories by volderine de Clare. this is a library of works recording all library works recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the triumph of youth of selected works letters sketches and stories by volterine de Clare. the afternoon blazed and glittered along the motionless treetops and down into the yellow dust of the road under the shadows of the trees among the powdered grass and bushes sat a woman and a man the man was young and handsome in a way with a lean eager face and burning eyes a forehead in the old poetic mould crowned by loose dark waves of hair his chin was long his lips parted devouringly and his glances seemed to eat his companion's face it was not a pretty face not even ordinarily good-looking salut not young only youngish but there was a peculiar mobility about it that made one notice it she waved her hand slowly from east to west indicating the horizon and said dreamingly how wide it is how far it is one can get one's breath in the city i always feel that the walls are squeezing my chest after a little silence she asked without looking at him what are you thinking of bernard you he murmured she glanced at him under her lids musingly stretched out her hand and touched his eyelids with her fingertips and turned aside with a curious fleeting smile he caught at her hand but failing to touch it as she drew it away bit his lip and forcedly looked off at the sky and the landscape yes he said in a strained voice it is beautiful after the city i wish we could stay in it the woman sighed that's what i've been wishing for the last fifteen years he bent towards her eagerly do you think he stopped and stammered you know we have been planning a few of us to club together and get a little farm somewhere near would you do you think would you be one of us she laughed a little low sad laugh i wouldn't be any good you know i couldn't do the work that ought to be done i would come fast enough and i would try but i am a little too old bernard the rest are young enough to make mistakes and live to make them good but when i would have my lesson learned my strength would be gone it's half gone now no it isn't burst out the youth you are worth half a dozen of those young ones old old one would think you were seventy 
and you are not old you will never be old she looked up where a crowd was wheeling in the air if she said slowly following its motions with her eyes you once plant your feet on my face and you will you impish bird my bernard will sing a different song no bernard won't retorted the youth bernard knows his own mind even if he's only a boy i don't love you for your face you she interrupted him with a shrug and a bitter sneer evidently who would a look of mingled pain and annoyance overspread his features how you twist my words you're beautiful to me and you know what i mean well she said throwing herself backwards against a tree trunk and stretching out her feet on the grass ripples of amusement wavering through the cloudy expression tell me what do you love in me he was silent beating his lower lip i'll tell you then she said it's my energy the life in me that is youth and my youth has overlived its time i've had had a long lease but it's going to expire soon so long as you don't see it so long as my life seems fuller than yours well but when the failure of life becomes visible while your own is still in its growth you will turn away when my feet won't spring any more yours will still be dancing and you will want dancing feet with you i will not he answered shortly i've seen plenty of other women i saw all the crowd coming up this morning and there wasn't a woman there to compare with you i don't say i will never love others but now i don't if i see another woman like you but i never could love one of those young girls shh shh she said glancing down the road where a whirl of dust was making towards them in the centre of which moved a band of bright young figures there they come now don't they look beautiful there were four young girls in front their faces radiant with sun and air and daisy wreaths in their gleaming hair they had their arms around each other's waist and sang as they walk with neither more accord nor discord than the birds about them the voices were delicious in their youth and joy one heard that they were singing not to produce a musical effect but from the mere wish to sing behind them came a troop of young fellows coarse of heads bare racing all over the roadside jostling each other and purposely provoking scrambles the tallest one had a nimbus of bright curls crowning a glowing face dimpled and sparkling as a child's the girls glanced shyly at him under their lashes as he danced about now in front and now behind them occasionally tossing them a flower but mostly hustling his comrades about behind these came older people with three or four very little children riding on their backs as the group came abreast of our couple they stopped to exchange a few words then went on when they had passed out of hearing the woman sat with a sphinx-like stare in her eyes looking steadily at the spot where the bright head had nodded to her as it passed like a wild flower on a stalk she murmured softly narrowing her eyes as if to fix the vision like a tall tiger lily her companion's face darkened perceptibly what do you mean what do you see he asked the vision of youth and beauty she answered in the tone of a sleepwalker and the glory and triumph of it the immortality of it its splendid indifference to its ruined temples and all its humble worshippers do you know turning suddenly to him with a sharp change in face and voice what i would be weak enough to do if i could he smiled tolerantly you weak dear one you couldn't be weak oh but i could if there were any way to fix davy's head forever just as he passed us now forever so that all the world might keep it and see it for all time i would cut it off with his hand yes i would her eyes glittered mercilessly he shook his head smiling you wouldn't kill a bug let alone davy i tell you i would do you remember when nathaniel died i felt bad enough but do you know the week before when he was so very sick i went out one day to a beautiful glen we used to visit together they had been improving it they had improved it so much that the water is all dying out of the creek the little boats that used to float like pond lilies like all helpless in the mud and hardly a ribbon of water goes over the fall and the old giant trees are withering oh it hurt me so to think the glory of a thousand years was vanishing before my eyes and i couldn't hold it and suddenly the question came into my head if you had the power would you save natalia's life or bring back the water to the glen and i didn't hesitate a minute i said let nathaniel die and all my best loved ones and i myself but bring back the glory of a glen when i think she went on turning away and becoming dreamy again of all the beauty that is gone 
that i can never see that is lost forever the beauty that had to alter and die it stifles me with the pain of it why must it all die he looked at her wonderingly it seems to me he said slowly that beauty worship is almost a disease with you i wouldn't like to care so much for mere outsides we never long for the thing we are rich in she answered in a dry changed voice nevertheless his face lighted it was pleasant to be rich in the thing she worshipped he had gradually drawn near her feet and now suddenly bent forward and kissed them passionately don't she cried sharply it's too much like self-abasement and besides his face was white and quivering his voice choked well what besides the time will come when you will wish you had reserved that kiss for some other food someone to whom it will all be new who will shudder with the joy of it who will meet you halfway who will believe all that you say and say like things in fullness of heart and i perhaps will see you and know that in your heart you are sorry you gave something to me that you would have ungiven if you could he buried his face in his hands you do not love me at all he said you do not believe me a curious softness came into the answer oh yes dear i believe you years ago i believed myself when i said the same sort of thing but i told you i am getting old i cannot unmake what the years have made nor bring back what they have stolen i love you for your face the words had a sting in them and for your soul too and i am glad to be loved by you but do you know what i am thinking he did not answer I am thinking that as I sit here, beloved by you and others who are young and beautiful, it is no lie, in a well, in a triumph I have not sought, but which I am human enough to be glad of, envied no doubt by those young girls, I am thinking how the remorseless feet of youth will trample on me soon and carry you away. And, very slowly, in my day of pain, you will not be near, nor the others. I shall be alone, age and pain are unlovely. You won't let me come near you, he said wildly. I would do anything for you. I always want to do things for you to spare you, and you never let me. When you are in pain, you will push me away. A fairly exultant glitter flashed in her face. Yes, she said, I know my secret. That is how I have stayed young so long. See, she said, stretching out her arms, other women at my age are past the love of men. Their affections have gone to children and I have broken the law of nature and prolonged the love of youth because I have been strong and stood alone. But there is an end. Things change. Seasons change. You, I, all change. What's the use of saying never, forever, forever, never? Like the old clock on the stairs. It's a big lie. I won't talk any more, he said. But when the time comes, you will see. She nodded. Yes, I will see. Do you think all people are like? As like as aunts people are vessels which life fills and breaks as it does trees and bees and other sorts of vessels they play when they are little and then they love and then they have children and then they die aunts do the same to be sure but i don't deceive myself as to the scope of it the crowd were returning now and by tacit consent they arose and joined the group down the road they jumped a fence into a field and had to cross a little stream where is our bridge called the boys we made a bridge. Someone has stolen our bridge. Oh, come on, cried David. Let's jump it. Free ran and sprang. They landed laughing and taunting the rest. Bernard sought out his beloved. Shall I help you over? He asked. No, she said shortly. Help the girls. And brushing past him, she jumped, falling a little short and mudding a foot, but scrambling up unaided. The rest debated, seeking an advantageous point. At last they found a big stone in the middle, and pulling off his shoes, Bernard waddled in the creek helping the girls across the smallest one large eyed and timid clung to his arm and let him almost carry her over he does it real natural observed davy who was whisking about in the daisy field like some flashing butterfly they gathered daisies and laughed and sang and chattered till the sun went low then they gathered under a big tree and spread their lunch on the ground and after they had eaten the conversation lay between the sallow-faced woman and one of the older men a clever conversation filled with quaint observations and curious sidelights the boys sat all around the woman questioning her eagerly but behind in the shadow of the drooping branches sat the girls silent unobtrusive holding each other's hand now and then the talker cast a furtive glance from bernard's rather withdrawn face 
to the faces in the shadow and the enigmatic smile hovered and fitted over her lips three years later on the anniversary of that summer day the woman sat at an upstairs window in the house on the little farm that was a reality now the little cooperative farm where ten free men and women labored and loved she had come with the others and done her best but the cost of it hard labor and merciless pain was step on the face that looked from the window she was watching bernard's figure as it came swinging through the orchard presently he came in and up the stairs his feet went past her door then turned back irresolutely and a low knock followed her eyebrows bent together almost sternly as she answered come in he entered with a smile can i do anything for you this morning no she said quietly you know i like my own cranky ways i i'd rather do things myself he nodded i know i always get the same answer shall you go to the picnic you surely will keep our foundation day picnic perhaps later and perhaps not there was a curious tone of repression in the words well he answered good naturally if you won't let me do anything for you i will have to find someone who will is bella ready to go this half hour bella here is bernard and bella came in bella the timid girl with a brilliant complexion and gazelles of eyes bella radiant in her youth and feminine daintiness more lovely than she had been three years before she gave bernard a lunch basket to carry and a shawl and a work bag and a sun umbrella and when they went out she clung to his arm besides she stopped near one of their own rose bushes and told him to choose a bud for her and she put it coquettishly in her dark hair the woman watched them till they disappeared down the lane he had never once looked back then her mouth settled in a quiet sneer and she murmured how long is forever three years after a while she rose and crossed to an old mirror that hung on the opposite wall staring at the reflection it gave back she whispered drearily you are ugly you are eaten with pain you still expect the due of youth and beauty did you not know it all long ago then something flashed in the image something as if the features had caught fire and burned i will not she said hoarsely her fingers clenching i will not surrender was it he i love it was his youth his beauty his life and younger youth shall love me still stronger life I will not, I will not die alive. She turned away and ran down into the yard and out into the fields. She would not go on the common highway where all went. She would find a hard way through woods and over hills, and she would come there before them and sit and wait for them where the ways met. Bareheaded, ill-dressed and careless, she ran along, finding a fire's pleasure in trampling and breaking the bush that impeded her. There was the road at last and right ahead of her an old old man hobbling along with bent back and eyes upon the ground just before him was a bad hole in the road he stopped irresolute and looked around like a crippled insect stretching its antenna to find a way for its mangled feet she called cheerfully let me help you he looked up with dim blue eyes helplessly seeking she led him slowly around the dangerous place and then they sat down together on the little covered wooden bridge beyond ah murmured the old man shaking his head it is good to be young and there was the ghost of admiration in his watery eyes as he looked at her tall straight figure yes she answered sadly looking away down the road where she saw bella's white dress fluttering it is good to be young the lovers passed without noticing them absorbed in each other presently the old man hobbled away it will come to that too she muttered looking after him the husks of life and of the triumph of youth section ten of selected works letters sketches and stories by voltairine de Clare. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. The old shoemaker of selected works, letters, sketches, and stories by Voltairine de Clare. He had lived a long time there, in the house at the end of the alley, and no one had ever known that he was a great man. He was lean and palsied, and had a crooked back. His beard was grey and ragged, and his eyebrows came too far forward. There were seams and flaps in the empty yellow old skin, and he gaps horribly when he breathed, taking hold of the lintel of the door to steady himself when he stepped out on the broken bricks of the alley he lived with a frightful old woman who scrubbed the floors of a rag shop 
and drank beer and growled at the children who poked fun at her he had lived with her eighteen years she said stroking the furry little kitten that curled up in her neck as if she had been beautiful eighteen years they had been drinking and quarrelling together and suffering she had seen the flesh sucking away from the bones and the skin falling in upon them and the long lean fingers growing more lean and trembling as they crook round his shoemaking tools it was very strange she had not grown thin the beer had bloated her and rolls of weak shaking flesh lapped over the ridges of her uncle figure her pale lacklustre blue eyes wandered aimlessly about as she talked no he had never told her not even in the quarrels not even when they were drunken together of a great visitor who had come up the little alley yesterday walking so stately over the sun-beaten bricks taking no note of the others and coming in at the door without asking she had not expected such an one how could she but the old shoemaker had shown no surprise at the mighty one he smiled and set down the teacup he was holding and entered into communion with the stranger he noticed no others but continued to smile and the infinite dignity of the unknown fell upon him and covered the wasted old limbs and the hard wizened face so that all we who entered bowed and went out and did not speak but we understood for the mighty one gave understanding without words we had been in the presence of freedom we had stood at the foot of tabor and seen this worn old world soiled soul lose all its dross and commonplace and pass upward smiling to the transfiguration in the hands of the mighty one the crust had crumbled and dropped away in impalpable powder souls should be mixed of it no more only that which passed upward the fine white playing flame the heart of the long lifelong watchers of patience should rekindle there in the perennial ascension of the great soul of man and of the old shoemaker section eleven of selected works letters sketches and stories by voltavine de clare this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lucy perry where the white rose died from selected works letters sketches and stories by voltarine de clare it was late at night a raw rough-shouldering night that shoved men in corners as having no business in the street and the few people in the north-bound car drew themselves into themselves radiating hedgehog quills of feeling at their neighbours presently there came in a curious figure clothed in the drapery of its country's honour the blue flannel flapping very much about its legs i looked at its feet first because they were so very small and girlish and because the owner of them adjusted the flapping pants with the coquetry of a maiden switching her skirts then i glanced at the hands they also were small and womanish and constantly in motion at last the face expecting a fresh young boy's not long away from some country village it was the sunk seamed face of a man of forty-five seared with iron-grey eyebrows but lit by twinkling young eyes that gleamed at everything good-humouredly the sailor's pancake with its official lettering was pushed rakishly down and forward and looking at the hat and wearer one instinctively turned milliner and decorated the shape with aigrettes and bows they would nod so accordant with the flirting head presently the restless hands went up and gave the hat another tilt went down and straightened the divided skirt folded themselves an instant while the little feet began tattooing the car floor and the scintillant eyes looked general invitation all round the car no perceptible shrinkage of quills however so the eyes wandered over to their image in the plate glass and directly the hat got another coquettish dip and the skirts another flirt and settle the conductor came in someone to talk to at last will you let me off at the ninth and race the dim chill of a smile shivered over the other faces in the car ninth and race whoever heard a defender of his country's glory ask a conductor on a street car in philadelphia for any other point than ninth and race the conductor nodded appreciatively just come to the city i suppose he said interlocutively the sailor plucked off his hat exhibiting his label with childlike vanity s s alabama here for three days just been over in new york like it remarked the conductor prolonging his stay inside the car the hat went on again proudly sixteen years in the service yes sir sixteen years the service is all right the service is good enough for me live there expect to die there sixteen years you won't forget to let me off at ninth and race no going to see chinatown sure 
Chinatown's all right. Seen it in Hong Kong, want to see it in Philadelphia. O oh, cradle of my country's freedom. These are your defenders. These to whom your chief delight is your stews and your brothels, your fantans and your opium dens, your sinks of filth and your cesspools of slime. Let them only be as they were, at Hong Kong, or worse, and the service asks no more. He will live in it and die in it, and it's good enough for him. Oh, not your old-time patriotic legends, nor the halls of the great rebel birth, nor the solemn silent bell that once proclaimed liberty throughout the land, nor the piteous relics of your dead wise men, nor any dream of your bright pure young days, when yet you were a fair green country townie, swims up in the vision of the service, when he sets his foot within your borders, filling him with devotion to old lady liberty, and drawing him to new world pilgrim shrines. Not these, oh no, not these, but your leper spot, your old world plague house, your breeding ground of pest begotten human vermin. So there is Chinatown, and electric glare enough upon it, and rat holes enough within it. The service is good enough for him. He will shoot to order in your defence till he dies. Rat tap tat went the little feet upon the floor, and the pancake got another rakish pull. Presently the active figure squared sharply about and faced the door. The car had stopped, and a drunken man was staggering in. The sailor caught him good-humouredly in his arms, swung him about, and seated him beside himself with a comforting, "'Now you're all right, sir. Sit right here, my friend.' The drunkard had a sodden, stupid face, and bleary eyes from which the alcohol was oozing. In his shaking hand he held a bunch of delicate, half-opened roses. Hothouse roses, cream and pink. The odour of them drifted faintly through the car like a whiff of summer. Something like a sigh of relaxation exhaled from the hedgehogs, and a dozen commiserating eyes were fastened on the ill-fated flowers. So fragile, so sweet, so inoffensive, so wantonly sacrificed. The hot, unsteady clutching hand had already burned the stems, and the pale, helpless faces of the roses drooped heavily. The drunkard, full of beery effervescence, cast a bubbling look over the car, and spying a young lady opposite, suddenly stood up and offered the bouquet to her. She stared resolutely through him, seeing and hearing nothing, not even the piteous child blossoms, with their pleading, down-bent heads, and with the confused muttering of, "'No offence, no offence, you know,' the man sank back again. As he did so, the uncertain fingers released one stem, and a cream-white bloom went fluttering down like a butterfly with broken wings. There it lay, jolting back and forth on the dirty floor, and no one dared to pick it up. Presently the drunkard sopped over comfortably on the sailor's shoulder, who, with a generally directed wink of bonhomie, settled him easily, bestowing a sympathetic pat upon the bloated cheek. The conductor disturbed the situation by asking for his fare. The drunkard stupidly rubbed his eyes and offered his flowers in place of the nickel. Again they were refused, and after a fluctuant search in his pockets between intervals of nodding, the dirty, over-fingered bit of metal was produced, accepted, and the still-dying blossoms shivered in the torturer's hands. He was drowsing off again, when, by some sudden turn of obstructed machinery in his skull, his lids opened, and he struggled up. The image of myself must have swum suddenly across the momentarily acting eye nerve, and with gurgling deference, at the imminent risk of losing his equilibrium once more, he proffered the bouquet to me grabbing the heads and presenting them stem-end towards. A smothered snuffle went round the car. I wanted them. Oh, how I wanted them! My heart beat suffocatingly with the sense of baffled pity and rage and cowardice. Who was he, that drunken sot with his smirching, wabbling hand, that I should fear to take the roses from him? Why must I grind my teeth and sit there helpless while these beautiful things were crushed and blasted and torn in living fragments? I could take them home, I could give them drink, they would lift up their heads, they would open wide, for days they would make the room sweet, and the pale, soft glory of their inimitable petals would shine like a luminous promise across the winter. Nobody wanted them, nobody cared, this sodden beast in the flare-up of his consciousness wished to be quit of them. Why might I not take them? Something sharp bit and burned my eyelids as I glanced at the one on the floor. The conductor had stepped on it and crushed it open, and there lay the marvellous creamy leaves, curled at their edges, like kiss-seeking lips, each with its glory greater than Solomon's, all fouled and ruined in the human reek. And I dared not save the others. Miserable coward! I forced my hands tighter in my pockets, and turned my head away towards the outside night and the backward slipping street. Between me and it, a dim reflection wavered, the image of the thing that stood there before me. And somewhere, like a far-off dulled bell, I heard the words, And God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. The sailor, no doubt with the kindly intention of relieving me from annoyance, and not averse to play with anything, made pretence of seizing the roses. Then the drunkard, 
in an abandon of generosity, began tearing off the blossoms by the heads, scrutinising and casting each away as unfit for the exalted service of his friend, till the latter, reaching out, managed to get hold of a white one with a stem. He trimmed its sheltering green carefully, brought out a long black pin, stuck it through the stalk, and fastened the pale shining head against his dark blue blouse. All the hedgehoggery smiled. We had thrust the roses through with our forbidding quills. What matter that a barbarian nail crucified this last one? The drunkard slept again, limply holding his scattering bunch of headless stems and torn foliage. Pink and cream the petals strewed the floor. Where was the loving hand that had nursed them to bloom in this hard, unwanted weather? Loved and nursed and sold them! Ninth and race, sang out the conductor. The sailor sprang up with a merry grin, bowed gaily to everyone, twinkled his fingers in the air with a blithe, Ta-ta! I'm off for Chinatown, as he slid through the door, and was away in a trice, tripping down to the pestiferous sink that was awaiting him somewhere. And on his breast he wore the pallid flower that had offered its stainless beauty to me, that I had loved, but had not loved enough to save. The rest were dead, but that one, somewhere down there in a den where even the gas-choked lights were leering like prostitutes' eyes, down there in that trough of swill and swine, that pure still thing had yet to die. End of Where the White Rose Died Recording by Lucy Perry in Bath on February the 27th, 2009. Section 12 of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. A Lance for Anarchy of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. The perusal of Dr. Carus's article, Free Thought, Its Truth and Its Error, in The Open Court of August the 6th, has impelled me to a parallel line of thought concerning a doctrine, a principle, less understood, more misinterpreted, both by enemies and followers, than even that much abused, much misunderstood, much misinterpreted principle of free thought. And as is the case with the latter, the greatest damage proceeds not so much from the opposition of prejudice as from the profession of ignorance. Free thought, says Dr. Carus, has arisen in revolution to blind obedience. It was indeed the great revolt against human authority over the action of the mind. It was not merely a negation, no revolt ever is. It was the assertion that the individual mind must think according to necessity, according to its own law. And this assertion rooted the negation of that authority which sought to interfere with the law in the confusion-working effort to build all minds after one fixed pattern. Mark, it was the very fact that thought is not, cannot be free in the absolute sense, is not a thing of caprice, willing to think this or that, but a thing of order constantly adapting itself to the relations of all other things, constantly progressing in the knowledge of truth as it fulfils the law of its growth. It was this which justified, nay, made at all conceivable, the revolt against dressed authority, that is, God, that is, priests. Here was a contradiction, or, as he would prefer to call it, an antinomy, to delight the heart of Proudhon. Thought struggled for liberty because of its fatalism. Conceiving the implacable authority of truth, it denied authority. It would be free from men, because it could not be free from self. With the light of a widening infinite in its eyes, it denied the supremacy of the sun. Come, it said, you are great, but you are not all. Do not think by your near shining to shut out the stars. Now this, precisely this, lies at the root of that doubly abused, misunderstood, misinterpreted word, anarchism. Anarchism is negation, you say. True. Of what? The authority of rulers, precisely as free thought negatives the authority of priests. But why this negation? Because of the affirmation that every individual is himself, ruled by the fatalism of existence, within himself contains the law of right being from which he can no more escape than sunlight can exist independent of the sun, 
and a strict obedience to which is necessary to that morality which Dr. Carus has called living the truth, disobedience in its stead creating ever-increasing confusion, only to be wrought out and purified after many lives, the weary karma of the race, and never wholly purged till the wronged law receives its recompense, understanding and fulfilling. Hence this negation of archism, which would maintain a puny, false authority, denying the real one, hindering true order and progress. And the real anarchist can truthfully say to the Republican, it is you, not I, who deny self-government. I say a real one, because as there are free thinkers and free thinkers, so there are anarchists and anarchists, and as I have intimated the greatest damage to either cause proceeds from the ignorant profession of them by people of whose lives they form no part. No real free thinker comprehending the laws of racial growth will for a moment deny the value of the creeds so long as they were the highest possible conception of life that is, while humanity yet remained below the creed. Nor will he deny that until a thinker has risen above the creed, comprehending himself, realising that the laws of his mind's guidance exist with it, cannot be conceived apart the one from the other, until this conception of right guidance from within has taken the place of the old idea of a law descended from heaven, the freethinker will admit that such a mind is better left among the orthodox than to become so poor an apology for a reformer as he must become by throwing away his old beliefs, not replacing them with the faith of truth. So the real anarchist, instead of maintaining as prejudice would have it appear the utter abolition of social restraint, the bursting of every bond which man by slow experience has found necessary to order, the inauguration of chaos, maintains, on the contrary, the higher principle that every man must be a law unto himself, embodying in himself all the truth of the codes, and denying their authority beyond this, because he realises this, knowing the glory of the truth he holds, would maintain his freedom to reach out after that which is higher still, unknown, but not unknowable. Anarchism is, in fact, the assertion of the highest morality, a conception of society without officials, police, military, bayonets, prisons, and the thousand and one other symbols of force which mark our present development, a dream of the day when, each having mended one, all will be mended. To him who has arrived at such a conclusion, there is no morality in obedience to outward authority, neither in the observance of formulas, neither in doing what is written in statute books, one is moral only so far as he, by long struggle it may, probably will, be, makes right his nature, him. What then? Does he therefore deny the value and the present necessity of codes? Not at all. He would not, if he could, sweep them at once from existence, well knowing that as long as men are incapable of receiving the authority of the inward must, they are incapable of living without statutes, Yet prejudice and ignorance cry, anarchy is the destruction of the law. It is not the destruction of the law, it is the fulfilling of the law. It is the only logical outcome of free thought, the ripened fruit of which free thinking is the potent seed. A small seed, as Dr. Carus says, but it is a seed which was planted in hard soil, watered by red rains, and nurtured among jealous thorns. And yet the tree is scarcely blossoming, and still we dare to dream of that russet warm day of autumn future, when the promise of the seed shall be fulfilled, when every mind shall think according to its own law, and every life express itself freely, bounded only by the equal freedom of others, so finding the more quickly, the more surely, the truth which alone shall live. End of A Lance for Anarchy Section 13 of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibraVox recording. All LibraVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Letter to Senator Hawley of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. Letter to Senator Hawley, in reply to U.S. Senator Joseph R. Hawley's remark, in the wake of the McKinley assassination, that it would pay a thousand dollars to have a shot at an anarchist. You may by merely paying your car fare to my home, address below, shoot at me for nothing. I will not resist. I will stand straight before you at any distance you wish me to and you may shoot in the presence of witnesses does not your american commercial instinct seize upon this as a bargain but if payment of the one thousand dollars is a necessary part of your proposition then when i have given you the shot i will give the money to the propaganda of the idea of a free society in which there shall be neither assassins nor presidents beggars nor senators end of letter to senator Hawley. Section 14 of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches, and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Philosophy of Selfishness and Metaphysical Ethics Of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches, and Stories by Voltairine de Clare. In number 197 of the open court appeared a criticism of the egoistic conception of life from the pen of Mr. Slater, in which I was deeply interested. Interested because I believe that as one of the leaders of the ethical movement, Mr. Slater is aware that there is no more frequent or more fatal error to overcome in his work than this very philosophy of selfishness and therefore should be one of those best conversant with the proofs of its shallowness and falsity. It is plain that the increasing interest in the ethical problem is evident of the unrest which sits upon humanity in the presence of the destruction of its temple. Science has torn the veil from the tabernacle of fear. Man has looked within and the space he imagined filled with terrible ghosts is seen to be empty. Only the darkness kept him from knowing it. Now there is light, light everywhere, and he no longer accepts the moral code, Obey. Yet knowing this, in the face of the death of God, he finds himself only at the statement of the problem. The symbols and the forms of religion the vestments of priests have become only mockeries, signs of the crude worship of a half-savage imagination. And still, bound up in them, was a something that was true, something of which he dares not let go, something that had served to guide his actions and give meaning to life. This was the ethical problem, to undress the truth and leave it nude, white, shining, a luminous point moving before man into the infinite, the future, to explain what good it was that wrapped in the dogmas of the church, nevertheless bound men together and served to lift the race slowly upward. It is at this questioning point that radical free thought has too often made its mistake. It falls into one of two errors, and the most grievous, I believe, is this of making self the center and circumference of all consideration. The most brilliant of American orators, the idol of free thought, has been so mistaken, and all his writings are permeated with the happiness philosophy. Grieved and disgusted with a world which, for love of love, has slain love, he has conceived that the way to improve matters is to cease urging the necessity of goodness, and insist that people shall be happy, his conclusion being that a happy man is a good man. The same teaching, variously expressed by the most trenchant pens, is to be found throughout the radical press. It says, practically, the universe is purposeless. Man's actions are accountable to no one. Therefore, let him be happy. 
let him study to discover what line of conduct will increase the sum of his agreeable sensations, and follow it. The desire for such increase is the motive to all action, whether of the barbarian or the civilized man, the only difference being that the civilized man has wider knowledge and a greater number of emotions. It was the fundamental error of this reasoning which I had hoped Mr. Slater would have pointed out. Unfortunately, he falls into the other mistake, the substance of his article being comprised in the old metaphysical formula, do right because it is right. People desire certain things or objects, and while the getting of them gives us pleasure, it is not so much the pleasure as the things we want. This is an explanation which does not explain. He is right in saying that the getting of them gives us pleasure. Pleasure is the result of action, not its cause. But to substitute for the assertion, I save a man's life because it gives me pleasure, I save a man's life because I want him to have his life, is to get no farther on. It does not explain why I want a thing which is of no particular benefit to myself. And it is the why of the want that prompted the action. It serves no purpose to tell people to do right because it is right unless they have a means of determining what is right and why it is right. Unless the ethical movement can answer this question, it has furnished no enduring structure to replace the old. It has not revealed the truth of the old. Science, which has shattered idols, must explain religion. Nor is this so difficult when once we have understood ourselves. Realizing that we are parts of the universe subject to the same processes manifest in all other forms of life. Realizing that our egos are but social growths that develop according to inheritance and environment as do all other growths. We are prepared to realize that our actions are prompted by the unconscious me, the man which has been accumulating, so to speak, for ages, the social soul which is the common inheritance of all. This large me, which lies below our conscious selves, is the result of all the untold struggle of man to come out in harmony with his environment. And the same struggle goes on in us, will go on in the future. Our pleasure is an insignificant quantity, having nothing whatever to do with the question. Indeed, it is pain, not pleasure, which unbars the gate of progress, since all progress comes through a quickened consciousness that we are no longer in harmony with our environment an awakening to the fact that the social ideal has moved forward and we must follow it. To illustrate, chattel slavery was right so long as the ideals of men had not advanced beyond it. The yoke rested easily upon the body of the slave and the soul of the master. Both were happy. Why have they not remained so? Servants obey your masters was to do right because it was right why not have continued? Because with the development of the vast economies of modern production, the chattel slave system no longer held its old relations in society. The unconscious me clamored for adjustment. The social ideal of larger liberty had extended to the black men. In the end, armies killed each other. For pleasure? Hardly. For duty? Yes, to accomplish their ideal of right. It is very shallow to retort, that is the result of the duty superstition. People kill each other. As well blame those who first conceived of communication between two villages for building turnpikes instead of at once jumping to steel rails and locomotives. The rightness of an action is measured by its harmony with the ideal which science points out as the path of the social march. Upon this foundation, the ethical movement may rest, knowing the truth of the old creeds, 
that they bound men together and developed the social character, repressing the instincts of selfishness, instead of scattering, disintegrating, and belittling men, which is the inevitable result of the egoistic philosophy, the gospel of caprice. End of The Philosophy of Selfishness and Metaphysical Ethics Recording by Rhonda Fetterman End of Selected Works Letters, Sketches, and Stories by Valterine Declare.